Peter B. Collins news and comment. He's at it again. It's Thursday, September 29th, 2016. This free daily podcast is now available on YouTube. Well, this is bizarre. The intelligence community has just completed its third open government national action plan. And guess what? The spooks are planning to offer a new award, a National Intelligence Professional Award, which would recognize professionals in the intelligence community who effectuate change by speaking truth to power, by exemplifying professional integrity, or by reporting wrongdoing through appropriate channels. This is unbelievable. <laughs> it's cartoonish. It is insulting. And it is more proof that Barack Obama's efforts at transparency amount to a major fraud. Now, if they had announced that they are going to retroactively recognize the contributions of people like Bill Binney, Kirk Wiebe, Russell Tice, Thomas Drake, John Kiriakou, Jeffrey Sterling. If they were announcing with the introduction of this concept that they're going to give this award retroactively to the whistleblowers who have courageously stepped up to speak truth to power, to try to effectuate change, and by reporting wrongdoing through appropriate channels. Because every one of the people I just named did that, and they faced incredible retaliation. And Tom Drake is the guy who really got beaten up. He was a top official at the NSA. He went through those channels. He went to the Congressional Oversight Committees. He went to the Inspector General. He checked off every frickin' box. And what did they do? They blamed him for somebody else's leaks to the New York Times. No, actually, that was Sterling. Uh, in the case of Tom Drake, he was accused of leaking classified information to the Baltimore Sun when, in fact, he had not. And they threw the Espionage Act at Drake. They took away his security clearance, and he ended up in a plea bargain to one charge so he could avoid going to jail. And George Orwell must be just... <laughs> doing cartwheels in his grave. Because this is just so... What is it? It is tragically dishonest. And I want to thank Linda Lewis, who is a whistleblower herself. She writes about whistleblowers. She's a listener and subscriber to this podcast. And a hell of a photographer, too. Uh, she put this up on Facebook, and I'm linking to it so you can read it and laugh for yourselves. Stephen Aftergood at the Federation of American Scientists reported this on his blog. The Third Open Government National Action Plan. It's kind of like the beginning of uh, Mission Impossible. This plan will self-destruct in five seconds. And who wants to be the first to test out this new award? I certainly wouldn't put myself forward. In alarming news, we learn that the planet is heating and that carbon dioxide is massing in new record and dangerous levels. A little background. The levels of CO2 in the atmosphere ebb and flow over the course of the seasons. Early fall always has the lowest atmospheric carbon dioxide levels of the year, but not this year. We are showing 400 parts per million in September. And historical data shows just how fast this number has climbed. When you go back to uh, a period of time, 400,000 years, levels fluctuated between 170 and 290 parts per million. Then after the Industrial Revolution and since 1950, atmospheric carbon has shot up from about 310 parts per million to over the 400 level that we see today. 
And this piece that I'm reading from Vice News shows that uh, they explain while there might not be a huge difference between the effects of 399 ppm or 401, the 400 mark has become an important symbolic threshold. March, for example, was the first month where all daily measurements exceeded 400. And in May, scientists clocked the first 400 parts per million uh, measurement ever in Antarctica the place with the lowest carbon concentrations on Earth. And this happens as we're in a, a political season where this huge threat to our future is played as a kind of a distraction. Well, Congress made a pretty courageous move yesterday, or did they? As I noted in yesterday's news and comment, the Senate had voted 97 to 1, and later in the day the House voted 348 to 77 to override Barack Obama's veto of the law called JASTA, Justice uh, for Spo State Sponsors of Terrorism. Uh, I can't get the acronym exactly right, but that's what the bill's about. And this would allow the uh, survivors of 9-11 victims to sue the nation of Saudi Arabia, and uh, presumably other nations where evidence leads to their involvement in the plots of September 11th, 2001. Now, on the face of it, as I said, this is this courageous move rejecting the president's love affair with Saudi Arabia. But I see it as political posturing and pandering for voters in advance of the November elections. And after the 97 to 1 vote in the Senate, 30 senators signed a letter expressing some reservations about the potential consequences of the law. Now that suggests to me that they were more interested in embarrassing Barack Obama than whatever concerns they have about the bad legal precedent that this sets and the opportunity for other nations to sue the United States, which I don't have a big problem with. <laughs> But uh, the inside-the-beltway attitude is, circle the wagons, we must never allow anyone to sue the United States, no matter what kind of wrongdoing we are responsible for. So uh, this is interesting, but I see it as political posturing. And today, in an in-depth interview that I'm releasing to subscribers with the tireless peace activist Medea Benjamin, we talk about her new book, which is called Kingdom of the Unjust, Behind the U.S.-Saudi Connection. And here is Medea reacting to the congressional action yesterday. Well, I'm still kind of scratching my head in disbelief that it actually happened and that the president could only muster one vote in the Senate, even among his own party, is quite remarkable, and it shows not only that people wanted to be on the side of the 9-11 victims and how uh, politically um, important that is, but it also shows how far the Saudis have sunk recently that those same senators didn't feel an obligation to uh, show their support for um, their Saudi allies. So I think it's just an amazing um, moment, not only for the importance of being able to take Saudi Arabia to court, but also uh, showing more and more the rift between our government, our people, and the Saudi government. And even Dianne Feinstein, the uh, aging California senator whom you challenged back in 2000 as the Green Party candidate, uh, she had made noises about supporting the president on this, uh, but she fell into line. I was actually surprised to see that. I find it shocking, and I'm glad you had the Jersey girls on, uh, because, boy, they, it took them 15 years, but in the end, they had some magical powers uh, to be able to pull this thing off with such a huge majority. And uh, you wonder, what the hell is wrong with Obama's lobby machine in the, in, in the White House that they weren't able to at least uh, make it a real fight? I'm releasing the full interview with Medea Benjamin of Code Pink to my subscribers today at PeterBCollins.com, at TuneIn, at Stitcher, and uh, iTunes, wherever you find the podcast. And Pam Wilson, uh, a listener, uh, alerted me that there have been some problems at Spreaker. 
and I'm in touch with them. We're working on it now. Uh, I couldn't find any PBC podcasts at Spreaker when I looked yesterday. So there is some sort of a, a glitch in the pipeline, and we'll get that fixed. But I also like to pause for a second and thank the people who support my work with your subscriptions. People like Kevin Beckley, Keith Hull, Pauline Nixon, and a new annual subscriber, Simon Morton. Simon, your bonus book is on the way. And I'm grateful for that support. I need more people to sign up. September, I've lost more subscribers than I gained. It's just a part of the ebb and flow. But if you value the work I do here, go ahead and step up. Now, I don't want your your dinner money, your Social Security money. I want people who are solvent, who can afford 5 10 20 bucks a month to support my work, or maybe take out one of those $50 annual subscriptions. And have I mentioned recently about our Super PBC app? It's for iPhones and iPads, and it's available at the Apple App Store. More news from Saudi Arabia, and this is also very well covered in Medea Benjamin's new book, about the subjugation of women. And the basis for it is uh, laws that uh, define male guardianship. And they uh, require a woman to have male consent to travel outside the country and without permission from a father, brother, son, or male relative. Women can't marry or obtain a passport. And the same is true for owning property or receiving hospital care. And 14,000 women took a risk. Because in Saudi Arabia, anybody who steps out of line is subject to prison terms, to flogging, or even to having your head chopped off. And 14,000 women said, screw you, King King Salman. Uh, We want some liberty. So it remains to be seen how this will play out. Uh, I certainly hope there isn't a crackdown on the women who have uh, spoken up in favor of their liberation. Saudi Arabia also managed to grind the United Nations into compromising on U.N. investigators who will be sent to Yemen to monitor war crimes and human rights abuses. And those have been occurring in uh, almost, uh, almost on a daily basis in Yemen. And uh, we also discussed Yemen with uh, Medea Benjamin in our interview today. At any rate, uh, Saudi Arabia has fended off the threat of an independent U.N. sanction inquiry into abuses in Yemen. The compromise after days of uh, tortuous negotiations in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, was described by Human Rights Watch as a limited step forward. Others described it as a flagrant failure of accountability. So the compromise will involve U.N. investigators being attached to an existing Yemeni National Commission Uh, looking at human rights abuses, and that commission has been condemned as partial, slow, and failing to meet acceptable international legal standards. Uh, And here's a quote from uh, Syed al-Wadai, who is a director of advocacy at the Bahrain Institute for Rights and Democracy. Members of the Human Rights Council, which are party in this conflict, have abused the UN rules to deflect accountability. This is another failure by the top human rights body, which shamefully accepts the membership of Saudi Arabia, one of the most brutal and cruel repressive states in the world, and allows it to dictate resolutions. Meanwhile, in the war in Syria, fueled by Saudi Arabia and its proxy fighters, the battle for Aleppo is getting uh, just (laughs) more and more contentious. There are now an array of 6,000 pro-Syrian government fighters who have gathered on the outskirts to essentially make a a final uh, assault on the rebels in Aleppo. But what's fascinating here is of the 6,000 soldiers, only about 1,000 or less are actually members of Bashar al-Assad's military. They have recruited 5,000 foreign fighters, mostly Iranians and some from Hezbollah, who will be doing uh, most of the heavy lifting. Meanwhile, Syrian planes, Russian jets are believed to have dropped more than 1,700 bombs on East Aleppo just since the beginning of this week. And those strikes have destroyed two more hospitals yesterday, taking to more than 40 the number of hospitals and clinics that have been destroyed and damaged in East Aleppo uh, since the Russian intervention to support Syria about a year ago. I have designated myself as the guy who is going to keep America aware of what I call lame duck mission creep. 
because nobody's paying attention to what, what Barack Obama is doing these days. We're all distracted by Trump and Hillary and, you know, a few other diversions that are going on. But the Pentagon quietly announced yesterday that 500 more, oh, I'm sorry, 600 more American soldiers in uniform with those boots that go on the ground will be sent to Iraq in the coming weeks. And this is in advance of a plan to uh, take back the city of Mosul from the Islamic State forces. And uh, this uh, adds to the roughly 4,600 troops that we have in Iraq. And candidate Clinton said the, uh, recently at the, uh, that, that forum in New York, they called it the Commander-in-Chief Forum, uh, she flatly said she ruled out putting large numbers of American troops on the ground in Iraq and Syria. But we're over 5,000 now. When does that number become sufficiently large for her to say no mas? And I don't know. Have you ever heard of Khalifa Hifter? He's a murky guy who now claims the title of field marshal and general in Libya. And he is running the rogue government that he has declared based in Benghazi. He's got an army. And he's claiming to have vanquished uh, Islamic State fighters along the Libyan coast of the Mediterranean, and in particular in the town of Sirte, which is an oil town. And Field Marshal General Hifter, before he returned to Libya after the fall of Gaddafi, was hanging out in suburban Virginia, not far from CIA headquarters. Now, that could be purely coincidental. <laughs> It could be. At any rate, Field Marshal General Hifter has rejected a U.N.-brokered government plan to unify the Tripoli government with the Benghazi government, and Hifter says he rejected it because he thinks the nation would be better served by a leader with high-level military experience. And we believe he's talking about himself, but he <laughs> refuses to get explicit about that. In the next breath... He offered praise for the military dictator of Egypt these days, President and uh, former Field Marshal General Abdel Fattah el-Sisi. And he said, military people who were elected to lead their country achieved remarkable success. Now, what I find also amusing, not only about Field Marshal General Hifter, but the Associated Press coverage here, which has the obligatory recap of how we got to where we are. And it reads thusly, Libya was plunged into chaos by the 2011 uprising that toppled and killed longtime leader Muammar Gaddafi, and for the last two years has been split by rival authorities based in the Far East and in Tripoli in the West. No mention of NATO, no mention of Hillary Clinton, no mention of Barack Obama leading from behind, no mention at all of how Gaddafi was taken out. It's described as simply an uprising that occurred in 2011. You and I know what really happened. So why does the media need to try to whitewash or sanitize that? Many people will whitewash and sanitize the record of Shimon Peres, who died yesterday at the age of 93. He's a longtime figure in Israeli politics, and it is fair to say that at times he embraced efforts at peace with the Palestinians. But Gideon Levy, who is one of the most brutally honest columnists in the world, and I credit the newspaper Haaretz that publishes him on a regular basis, he's written a very honest obit about Shimon Peres, whom he knew. He opens with, he was my private political instructor for four years, day and night. I was very young, and he was already Shimon Peres. His Israel was a country of great achievements, but also of shadows and lies. One cannot crown him a wondrous figure as the whole world is doing now without also describing his country. If Perez is a hero of peace, then the state of Israel is a peace-seeking country. Is anybody buying that? One cannot call it an occupier, a dispossessor, a pariah, while calling Perez a giant of peace. If Israel is on the verge of a moral abyss, then Perez had a part in that. If it's a country en route to apartheid, he was a founding partner. Levy continues, So we so want peace, but are doing so little to achieve it. 
He was the country's pretty face, but also misleading. Israelis are remembering him fondly now, how wonderful it is that we had such a man. Those world leaders who will be coming to his funeral tomorrow will also effusively praise his contribution to peace. But what peace? The man who gave us the Demona reactor and the 1956 Sinai operation, Upper Nazareth, Ofra, Israel Military Indus Industries, and Israel Aerospace Industries. So how much peace and justice did he really bring? How much occupation and settlements? There's no doubt that he wanted peace and worked for it, but he stopped halfway by ignoring the settlement issue during the Oslo process. And there are no half-paths to peace. It is not just the right that's responsible for that failure. And a little more. What did he do to end the occupation? He contributed a great deal to Israel, to its security, to its prosperity, but not to its justice. So just don't say he was a man of peace. He wanted peace. Who doesn't? But the truth must be told even in difficult moments. He never perceived the Palestinians as equal to Jews, and certainly not as having equal rights. Gideon Levy, Haaretz. Yahoo is now under fire because independent cyber investigators are telling us that it was not a state actor that hacked those uh, half million email accounts, I guess including one of mine. I did change the password last year. I don't know if I did that in time. At any rate, the uh, what's this company called? Uh, cyber security firm Info Armor asserts that the hack was carried out by a criminal gang known as Group E, which has been responsible for similar attacks on Dropbox, LinkedIn, and MySpace. We still don't know if this is going to derail the merger with Verizon. We don't know if Melissa Meyer is going to be accused of duplicity or uh, 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 of hiding this liability from Verizon. And Yahoo is not responding. While they've been saying that a state actor was to blame, so far today, they're not making public any proof of that claim or any notable response to this new assertion. Emails, damn emails, Hillary Clinton's damn emails. Well, we're learning some new information, and it all comes from Jason Leopold. This guy has been so amazing using the Freedom of Information Act, and he is in such a position that in court the other day, his lawyer essentially negotiated with the State Department. And they said, look, you can delay response to some of these other FOIA requests that Leopold has made, but we want you to get as many of the Clinton emails uh, out before the election as you possibly can. And at issue are 15,000 emails that Team Clinton deleted saying that they were personal, they were private, they were not work-related. But the FBI has determined that a full third of those, more than that, 5,600, were in fact work-related and should not have been deleted. Now, uh, Leopold speculates that some of these might be duplicates, some will be heavily redacted, and so we might not get some substantial information, but it could be additional information about Hillary Clinton's honesty and trustworthiness. Wells Fargo is back on the hot seat on Capitol Hill. Why don't they just roll a dunking machine into the hearing room? Now, I don't have any sympathy for John Stump. I'm a shareholder of Wells Fargo. I have a fat 100 shares in the bank. I bank there personally. I don't hold any credit cards with Wells Fargo. And I'm happy to see that the board has uh, shown some integrity, and they have stripped $41 million in vested stock options from John Stumpf. But up on Capitol Hill, he's the target that everybody can unload on with no consequence. And as I've pointed out, the hypocrisy is amazing. Many of these same people have turned a blind eye to the crimes of Goldman Sachs and the whole Wall Street gang that took the economy near the brink back in 2008. But hey, it's election season. Bernie Sanders made Wall Street unpopular. Why not pile on? So you got Carolyn Maloney from New York telling uh, Stumpf, your bank was turned into a school for scoundrels. You got South Carolina Republican Mac, oh, I'm sorry, Mick Mulvaney. Y'all were rotten. 
Stumpf wouldn't even be here if I was on the board of that company. You should be downright ashamed of yourself. Oh, I should change accents. That's David Scott, Democrat from Georgia. And Californians Brad Sherman and Maxine Waters are both calling for big banks to be broken up. Now, I'm in favor of that. And if they ride the Wells Fargo stagecoach to the point that they break it up, I'll be happy. But I don't expect that to happen. This is opportunistic election season attack mode. And for his own sake, Stumpf has said that his board, which is so independent and has members of, you know, that he appointed and he serves on other boards with, he kind of went to the board and said, hurt me, please. And so they're going to uh, make him forfeit, forfeit uh, equity awards, that's uh, stock options, and I misspoke a moment ago, it's unvested ones. So it's uh, future earnings that he's giving up. And also, they're going to cut his salary. They're not going to pay him while the investigation goes on. He makes just about $20 million a year. They're also clawing back uh, unvested awards from the vice president, Kerry Tolstead, who left the bank, retired, took the fall, and uh, they're going to grab some of her money. But notice that it's not coming out of their Wells Fargo accounts. It's funny money that they currently don't have. (laughs) Optics. Optics matter more uh, all too often than facts. Here in California, Governor Jerry Brown has signed a a new bill into law that lifts the statute of limitations for rape cases. This was inspired by the state's inability to prosecute Bill Cosby for his sexual aggression uh, alleged that occurred more than 20 years ago. I think that's good. President Obama is going to be receiving a bill that has passed unanimously out of both houses. And it's a remarkable bill that was driven by a 24-year-old survivor of sexual assault. And she got it introduced in February of this year. And it's loosely called a uh, Rape Survivors Bill of Rights. The actual title is the Sexual Assault Survivors Rights Act. And the woman has identified herself. She is 24-year-old Amanda Nguyen, and she works at the State Department. She is an aspiring astronaut. She was raped a while back in Massachusetts, and she learned that the collection of evidence in what's called a rape kit is not very well protected. And she found out that the statute of limitations allowed her 15 years to decide whether to cooperate on the criminal charges, but only six months before the state was allowed to destroy her rape kit. And, of course, if you don't have the evidence, it's very hard to pursue a prosecution later. And this, of course, is an issue because I don't know the details of her case, but I suspect they haven't found the man who raped her. And this is a problem that occurs all across the country, where these rape kits are gathered, And then the evidence is allowed to be destroyed or lost, or worse yet, it is never processed. And Nguyen correctly points this out in a quote to the Guardian newspaper. She says, the real fight is in the states. That's what we're gearing up for. We're working with a slew of state lawmakers who have already reached out and are eager to introduce this bill. Not a single state currently requires law enforcement to retain rape kits until that state's statute of limitations expires. And that is a huge, huge loophole in our sexual assault laws. So I have great news. Congress has passed a bill that includes partial funding to respond to the Zika virus crisis, and it does not include the Planned Parenthood poison pill. The Republicans were posturing all summer long, saying, we got a bill to help out the Zika problem, but the Democrats are blocking it. But the poison pill said that the money for Puerto Rico could not flow to Planned Parenthood. And because of the sexual transmission possibility of the Zika virus, Planned Parenthood is a logical partner to hand out condoms and other uh, preventive devices for safe sex to help educate people. And I am glad to see that the Democrats held out and did not cave in on the Planned Parenthood rider. They also had to accept less money than they asked for for Flint, Michigan, and for flood victims in Louisiana. And there's still issues about how to pay for this package. But they did pass it, and uh, that, I believe, will avert 
any prospect of a government shutdown be uh, before the election. And we get news from Alabama, where Bible-thumping Supreme Court Chief Justice Roy Moore is facing expulsion from the court again. Now, he was bounced from the court a few years back. Then he got reelected. He was bounced because he insisted on putting a uh, statue or a sculpture of the Ten Commandments on state property at the courthouse. Now, Roy Moore is facing another verdict from the Court of Judiciary in Alabama, which is reviewing charges about how he ordered courts not to allow same-sex marriage after the Supreme Court ruling last year. And he is facing charges of abuse of power. And it remains to be seen whether this court of judiciary will uh, throw Roy, Roy Moore off the bench once again. But he may then benefit from that by using it to run for governor, where we know uh, this guy Bentley is uh, dead in the water. He should have been impeached already. So while this could be an important uh, uh, sanction and setback for Roy Moore, he's such a wily coyote that uh, he may use it to bounce back and be in our faces again very soon. Now, let's end on a lighter note today. Will Durst weighs in on his idea of this year's possible October surprises. Hey, guys. Will Durst here with a warning, because when the days to an election dwindle down to a precious few, something happens to candidates, especially when prospects for victory appear slimmer than an emaciated giraffe in a funhouse mirror. And we should prepare not just for October surprises, but October lightning bolts tossed by Odin himself, October 80 megaton hydrogen bombshells, and October exposés that will make your mouth hang open long enough to attract bottle flies. So here's a sample of what may come down in these final weeks of this, the most important election of your lifetime. Yes, again. October 2nd. Breitbart News discovers that when the first words of Hillary Clinton's deleted emails from 2009 are arranged chronologically, a love letter to Lucifer is revealed in which she calls him Smoochy. October 10th. Photographs showing Donald Trump poking a group of special needs preschoolers with a stick are laughed off by the candidate as political correctness run amok. His poll numbers rise. October 14th. En route to a campaign stop in South Carolina, Hillary Clinton rushes into a burning building to rescue a litter of newborn kittens. Her poll numbers do not budge. October 22nd, Donald Trump explains that pushing an old lady in a wheelchair down a flight of stairs was a therapeutic attempt to jar loose her cramped muscles. His poll numbers rise. October 28th, murky footage from a surveillance camera showing Donald Trump shooting a stranger in the middle of Fifth Avenue in New York City racks up 3 million hits on YouTube in four hours. His poll numbers rise. November 1st, a report surfaces that Donald Trump has a calendar in which October has 32 days. The candidate agrees that many people have told him this. Important people, top people. Despite evidence to the contrary, supporters feel in their heart it must be true and make plans to vote a day late. November 8th, Trump loses. For Wilders.com, I'm Will Durst. Get it? It's a hoist on your own petard thing. There's Will Durst, the San Francisco stand-up comic and sit-down satirist. I'm Peter B. Collins. Thanks for listening. Happy trails to you Until we meet again Happy trails to you Keep smiling up